Hello, everyone. Thank you so much once again for joining us today. Happy World Pangolin Day, everybody. Um, and for those of you who are here, very happy uh, to, to have you. Uh, welcome to our fifth Conservation Champions webinar. Uh, my name is Vera, and I'm your host for the evening. So um, just an introduction. If you, this is your first time at our webinars, we organize these webinars to share more about wildlife conservation through the eyes and hands of our staff, as well as our conservation partners. And today we are going to talk about an animal that is very, very special to us, which is the pangolin. Um, and you may not have heard um, of them or seen one before, uh, or even know very much about them. Uh, and there's a really good reason for that. They are uh, very shy animals. They are very elusive animals. And even though the Sunda pangolin lives right on our doorstep um, in our forest here in Singapore, we don't really know very much about them, unfortunately. Right? This species, uh, the Sunda pangolin, is critically endangered like many of the other pangolin species in the world. Um, but here uh, at Mandai Wildlife Reserve, we have the good fortune to do work that protects this unique and also lovable species. Um, both in Singapore as well as in the region. So today, I'm very happy to introduce our speakers who are at the forefront of pangolin conservation here in Mandai. And um, our first speaker we have is Dr. Charlene Yong, uh, who is, if you attended our uh, previous webinar, she was also a guest. Um, so very happy to have her back with us today. Um, Dr. Charlene Yong is uh, a vet here at Mandai Wildlife Group. And she is part of the team that looks after the health care of the animals in our parks. Um, she also oversees the rescued native wildlife admissions, treatment, and rehabilitation. And she also co-chairs the Singapore Penguin Working Group, which coordinates penguin conservation in Singapore. Now, next speaker is Adi Kuniawan. He is an animal care officer at Mandai Wildlife Group. Uh, he's a part of the team that looks after the Sunda penguins at night safari. And he coordinates penguin conservation activities in the region and co-chairs the Southeast Asian branch of the IUCN Penguin oh, Specialist Group. Hi, everyone. All, All right. right. Thanks for joining us tonight. And before I start, I'd like to wish everyone a happy World Pangolin Day. Um, so as Vera has mentioned, I'm Dr. Charlie. I'm a vet uh, at Mandai, and together with my colleague Ade, we'll be sharing with you about Mandai's efforts in protecting pangolins. And just a warning um, before we start, that there will be some images of animals with injuries and of blood. So most of you know Mandai via our parks, right? The Night Safari, River Wonders, Singapore Zoo, and the upcoming Bird Paradise. However, did you also know that our conservation efforts are not just within our operating parks and upcoming attractions? We also have Mandai Nature, which is Mandai's conservation arm, which seeks to conserve biodiversity in Singapore and the region. In addition to that, Mandai is also a centre for rescued native wildlife, and this is actually a large part of what I do. So we receive rescued wildlife from all over Singapore, across all different species, but of course, today, we'll be focusing on pangolins. So there are eight species of pangolins in the world, all of which are threatened. Four species are found in Africa and four in Asia. And let's focus on the species that is found in Singapore. And that is the Sunda pangolin. And like many other pangolins, this species is critically endangered. And across its range, its greatest threats are illegal hunting and trade and habitat loss. Very little is known about the Sunda pangolin, including simple things like diet, behavior, ecology, and healthcare. And here we have a uniquely Singapore situation with pangolins. Elsewhere, the greatest problem is hunting and trade, whereas here, the greatest threats are actually habitat loss and urbanization. So in Singapore, the rescue circumstances are mostly associated with the urban environment in some way, as you can see um, on, uh, in the pictures here on the screen. So some pangolins have, may have just wandered into a building and then gotten lost that way. Um, but unfortunately, many are victims of road traffic accidents. 
And how does Mandai contribute to pangolin conservation? Well, we are members of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, Pangolin Specialist Group, which is a global network of professionals working together for pangolin conservation. And we are also co-chairs of the Singapore Pangolin Working Group. Now, this working group is a collaboration amongst various stakeholders, including government agencies like NPARCS, NGOs like ACUS and the Nature Society, and educational institutions like NUS. And our aim is to increase awareness and drive pangolin conservation in Singapore. In 2018, the Singapore Pangolin Working Group and, part and our partners published a National Conservation strategy, strategy and Action Plan, which really helps to guide all our pangolin conservation efforts here in this country. And the working group also does collect sightings of pangolins. And uh, these sightings are actually very important because they contribute to our understanding of pangolin behavior and distribution, which in turn can help to inform conservation action. So if you see a pangolin that is healthy and not in need of rescuing, do record your sighting on the website. Mandai is also very strongly involved in the Our Wild Neighbors initiative. Now, this is really special because it is the very first nationwide collaboration across multiple stakeholders in the nature community to promote human wildlife coexistence. The initiative is centered around the, the Our Wild Neighbors website, where you can find practical tips and advice on what to do when you encounter pangolins and other wildlife. How we behave affects people and the uh, animals around us. And so from my personal perspective and also as a vet, What's especially important is how we can keep wildlife and people safe. Now to bring things even closer to home, another of Mandai's contribution to pangolin conservation is the protection and enhancement of habitats in and around our parks and, 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 and upcoming attractions that are suitable for pangolins and other wildlife. The Mandai Wildlife Bridge, as you can see in the picture there, stretches across Mandai Lake Road and greatly improves wildlife connectivity in the area. And this bridge is one of the key features in the Mandai Rejuvenation Project. We also work very closely with partners for the rescue, rehabilitation and release of pangolins. And this is actually a very, very big part of what I do. So most pangolin rescues are carried out by MPARCS and ACUS. Um, and Mandai is a central processing center for all rescued pangolins. Um, and here we assess, treat and rehabilitate pangolins as necessary and releases of pangolins are done in conjunction with NPARCS. So what is wildlife rehabilitation? It is the temporary provision of care to injured, sick or orphaned wildlife with the ultimate goal of releasing them back into the wild. It's a little bit about numbers. Between 2015 to 2022, we received a total of almost 230 pangolins, both dead and alive. Last year alone, we received 52 pangolins. And um, unfortunately, more than a quarter of these pangolins came in really poor condition or were already dead. Almost 60% of admissions were actually released. So all pangolins that come to us undergo a thorough health check. We have a well-equipped veterinary hospital uh, for the animals under our care, and we extend this care to rescued pangolins and other wildlife also. So this includes the pangolins that come in poor condition and have to be euthanized, as well as the pangolins that actually already arrived dead. So here's a quick quiz. This is the focus of one of the checks that we carried out on pangolins. What do you think it is? Go ahead and type your answers in the chat. Answers coming up in the next slide. So a postmortem examination is carried out on all pangolins that die. And this is really to maximize the knowledge that we gain from each individual. So the sex and the weight of the individual is recorded. The cause of death is investigated. And this may be paired with other tools like radiographs or uh, X-ray images. So on the screen there is an image of a pangolin that came in from a road traffic accident. Can you ident identify what injuries he had? Let's take a moment to have a look at the image. 
So this poor fellow, unfortunately, his whole front leg was missing. And it's um, circled there. And he also had a dislocated right elbow. And what you can't see on the radiographs are the, were the extensive bruising and soft tissue injuries that he had. Some other pangolins that have also been hit by cars come in with broken backs and organ rupture. So other health conditions which may be incidental or contributed to the death um, are also investigated during a post-mortem examination. Samples are collected uh, for disease surveillance, and we work very closely with the authorities on this. We also collect semen. And so the picture that you guessed at in the previous slide, well, that was pangolin sperm seen through a microscope. And it's pretty unique because it's rather odd shaped, oddly shaped. So for the pangolins that come to us alive, some require treatment with or without rehabilitation before release. Let's talk a little bit about that now. And another quick quiz, which part of a pangolin's body is blood usually collected from? Go ahead and type your answers in the chat. So an anti-mortem examination is a health check that is done on a live animal. So for us, these checks are done when the pangolins are anesthetized. We record the sex and the weight of the animal, and we also do a physical exam. Now, just in case you're wondering, we don't make the pangolins take a fitness test, but we check for things like whether there are injuries on the nose, on the tongue, the eyes, the legs, and so on and so forth. We also run blood checks. And so where do we usually collect blood from in a pangolin? usually from the underside of the tail. So the ventral tail vein, as you can see in the picture that is now circled on the screen. We also do a lot of imaging studies, radiographs, which are X-ray images and ultrasound scans. These help to check the internal organs or even um, to check whether a pangolin is pregnant or not. Pangolins are also described to be prone to blood clotting disorders, so we also run tests to determine how fast the blood normally clots. And in live animals, we also collect semen so we can analyze the sperm and store it for future reproductive work. And a big part of what we do is also contributing to the veterinary knowledge of the species, including establishing anesthesia protocols and techniques. So one important aspect is, uh, of anesthesia is securing and protecting the animal's airway during anesthesia. So I'd like you to picture a pangolin's head. It's shaped like an ice cream cone with a very tiny mouth at the pointy end. So it's actually very difficult to see inside the mouth and all the way to the back of the mouth to even place a breathing tube in, in, into the trachea. And in this picture on the left, the breathing tube um, has been placed as indicated by the arrow that's now appeared on screen. Um, and if you look at the back of that picture there, the, um, this graph that's circled by the, um, that is circled on the screen indicates the carbon dioxide reading as the animal is breathing. So techniques also like placing an IV catheter as in the picture on the right hand side so that fluids and treatments can be delivered appropriately is also very important. And like all the checks that we do, all the bloods, the imaging, um, the radiographs, ultrasound scans, the semen analysis also contribute to the pool of knowledge for this species. So some animals do come in with injuries, such as scratches and abrasions. Can you guess how this pangolin got these scratches? It was actually from climbing over a barbed wire fence. And some of you may remember a photo at the beginning of the talk of a pangolin climbing over a fence topped with barbed wire. And that, was, that picture was taken by Acres. And this particular pangolin came in with multiple wounds all over the body, but the worst were on the tail we think that this pangolin may have been attacked by dogs. And most pangolins are, that are victims of road traffic accidents were already dead when they come to us. But this particular fellow was quite lucky and he came to us alive. He did have a complete fracture of his thigh bone though. Um, for the pangolins meant for release, we are always mindful to minimize handling right from the start, even as we're uh, uh, treating them uh, as necessary. This is to really keep them as wild as possible. So remember the pangolin in the previous slide with the very bad tail wounds? 
one of the ways we treated him was to clean and soak his wounds in a disinfectant every day. And so we used the carrier for the soaking so we wouldn't have to handle him all the time. So it really acted a little bit like a paddle pool for this pangolin. The tip of his tail was also very badly infected and was actually already dying off. So he needed part of his tail amputated. And this picture was taken during the surgery. And that picture, that pangolin with the broken thigh bone? Well, we worked with a veterinary surgeon partner to repair his fracture. And Adi will actually share a little bit more about this animal uh, later on. So once pangolins have made it through the intensive first stage of treatment, we then start preparing for the eventual release, however long that might take. And this actually may include keeping them mentally stimulated with puzzle feeders, such as this one, or encouraging them to exercise. Now, this particular animal needed his wounds to be kept clean, so his exercise was done inside the hospital at this stage. However, once they are better, they get exposed to much more natural settings, including foraging for wild foods, other natural substrates and environments, and encouraging them to climb and move about um, as they would normally in the wild. So for animals that are suitable for release, there are a few more things that we do before they are ready to go. We microchip them with a unique number. Now, this is similar to the microchips that are used for pet dogs and cats. If you've never seen the actual chip itself, this is what it actually looks like, like a little grain of rice. We also engrave part of the microchip number onto the scales of the pangolin to help with visual identification from afar. And when possible, we work with research partners to tag pangolins so we have an idea where they go after release. And that's the tag uh, right there circled on the screen. All pangolin releases are carried out by NPARCs. And sometimes they may look like this, a very small pangolin high up in a very big tree. So what about the pangolins that make it through treatment but are not suitable to be released? Well, those pangolins then come under the long-term care with us here at Mandai. And for that, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Ade. Over to you, Ade. Thanks, Shali. Can you guys see me? Whoops, I think that's an issue on my end. All right. All right. Uh, thanks again, Charlene. And uh, hi, my name is Adi, and I'm with the Animal Care Department. So I'm going to be sharing a bit about how we look after our pangolins here in Mandai, uh, what kinds of conservation roles they play, and some, some of the conservation efforts in our region. So Charlene gave a pretty good summary of how the pangolins end up here in Mandai. Uh, but just to give you a, a bit of info on when we started working with this species, it was in the 90s uh, when there was a small confiscation of live pangolins, uh, which gave our staff basically the first-hand experience at caring for them. And then it just dawned on us that uh, this was just the beginning. And over the years, the pangolin rescues just gradually increased. So in 2005, we began taking in and provided long-term care for individuals that were not suitable for release. And these pangolins play a very important role in the conservation of the species. Uh, but how exactly? And this is the part where you can figure out. So again, the question is, what conservation roles do pangolins play in our zoo? And what I mean by this is that by having them here and under our care, how does this contribute to conservation? So I can't see the questions, but, uh, the answers, but what, what are people saying? Can we give them a prize? No? If you get all four, there are four, four answers or four roles. If you get all four, I tell you, I'll, I'll uh, do a private tour for you guys <laughs> or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, we can't, we can't do that. No. So what, what have they said? So again, I repeat, yeah. what are the roles that pangolins play in our zoo? What are the conservation roles that they play? 
Reproduction. What else? Mascot. Mascot. Ah, okay. Education. Education, yeah. I'm going to give you all 10 more seconds, then I'll give you the answers. Educate. Was it? Can't see. Research. Did someone say research? Okay. I think you got two out of four, right? I'll just share the answers. So, starting with research, um, penguins are really poorly studied across the board, you know. Um, how do you protect something that you don't know or have no clue about? So when the first zoos took them in long ago, they could barely survive beyond a couple of days, you know, weeks or months. And fast forward to today, uh, there are pangolins that have lived for up to 20 years or so. And this is largely due to the advances in understanding the needs uh, through hands-on experience, as, as what Dr. Charlene said, right? And some of you mentioned education. So education or specifically conservation education is something that addresses the specific threats to the species. So just sharing stuff, you know, about the scales and all that is not really conservation education. Um, so education, a lot more, is more than just telling people things, uh, especially when you want to change deep-rooted behaviors. Uh, so having actual pangolins under our care can actually help convey these messages better. The third and fourth one, and I don't think anyone mentioned this, I'm not sure, uh, is insurance population and population restoration. So in all the range states that uh, where pangolins can be found, uh, they're basically wiped out in, in many of these areas, in many of the habitats uh, in, in these various countries. Uh, insurance population basically is a population under human care that serves to prevent species extinction. So assuming that the threats in the wild have been addressed, so there's no more poaching and stuff, then these insurance populations can then be used to restore wild populations. So these are the roles that live pangolins play in our zoos. So let's meet some of our pangolins here in Mandai. Uh, we have Angun here on the top left, Nita, Radin, and Brani. There are two more, uh, but I couldn't find any good photos for them. Now, with the exception of Radin here, who was born here, uh, all of them, the uh, remaining three here, uh, came to us under slightly different circumstances, but basically they were all rescued. Uh, with Sunda pangolins in general, we give them Malay or Indonesian names, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, as mentioned earlier, our pangolins play uh, an important role as conservation ambassadors. So I think some of you mentioned mascots, but the, the term is conservation ambassadors. So they enable us to convey very important messages about their conservation. Uh, and pangolins are also very cryptic animals. It's really hard to see one in a while. I don't know if any of you have actually seen one. Uh, but here in the night safari, you get a glimpse of what they're like. Uh, and there are very, very few zoos that do have them. So we are very lucky to be working and showcasing such a species. So you can see um, the pangolin on the left, it's uh, housed together with the civet, yeah. another local animal in Singapore, or another local animal. Now you go to Leopard Trail, is where, which is where uh, one of them is being um, housed. You might be able to see one of the pangolins there, Brani. Yeah, that's actually Brani, uh, the one with the broken leg, uh, the one Dr. Charlene shared earlier. So this here is Brani and he came, um, he was moved here just a couple of months back, uh, but look at him now, you know, he's swimming quite well. Um, so the reason why he's with us is that uh, although his wound has, has healed, uh, we're not very confident that he can be um, can survive in the wild, partly because he's been habituated, uh, you know, being treated here in, in Mandai. But at the same time, you know, with, with these wounds, you can never know uh, the long-term impact on their health as well. So, so, you know, I've always wondered if people actually learn anything visiting our parks. So I'm just, just going to share a bit of a story here. Um, so I was working one night, right, uh, at the nice Fire, obviously. And I met this family who, who wanted to specifically see our banglins. Apparently, uh, one of the kids that came, uh, you know, he, she saw it as a child like six or seven years ago. And it was for one of the programs that I did back then, you know, uh, for Kinderland. I don't know if any of you are from Kinderland. Uh, so this was six, six or seven years ago. So the kid was like this small. And then when I saw her six or seven years old, she was basically as tall as me. Already. 
so it's quite a good feeling like, when when uh, you know that people come here and you know, see our animals and they form an affinity for some of the species that we have. And it's this affinity that plays a part in, in being more um, conservation minded, I would say. Quick quiz. So, so, so aside from, of course, conservation uh, messages, we share other things, you know. So uh, we have here four animals that we have uh, in, in Mandai, not just in Night Safari. Actually, all, of, all four of them, oh no, except for the sloth, the sloths in the zoo. So which of the four animals, or which one of these four animals does not belong to the group? This, by the way, is a, is a common question that I throw whenever I do my programs here in Night Safari. So there's some people who say sloth, sloth, all three answers are sloth, is it? Yeah, sloth. I'm going to give you guys another 10 more seconds. So again, which one of the following animals does not belong to the group? What is that? Uh, no, no, no. So the question is, is which of the following animals does not belong to this group? Uh, yeah, which one is the odd one? Oh, yes, that's the easy way to ask. Taxonomically. <laughs> So I'm going to give you all the answer, huh? And the answer is, and this is this being the pangolin workshop. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we've been uh, uh, the pangolins actually. So the pangolins are not related to any of the three animals you saw: the sloth, uh, the armadillo there, and the giant anteater. So those guys they belong to basically one group, and they're found in the Americas. Whereas the pangolins, uh, they've evolved in, in Africa and Asia, and they're more related to carnivores, actually. So more related to cats and dogs. So it's quite strange, la, but that's what it is. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, pangolins at one point in history didn't live that long in zoos. And one of the reasons why is because of the food. So unlike, uh, say, anteaters, uh, who also eat the same thing, so you know ants and termites, uh, pangolins are extremely picky. So this here, uh, one of the pangolins eating uh, beaver ants uh, and beaver ants eggs. So that's one of their favorite ants, uh, ant species. And you can see them using the long sticky tongue. So what has led to this increased longevity in zoos and its diet? So zoos have been working hard to develop uh, and perfect the diets. So even in our case, our, our diets have evolved a fair bit. You know, at one point, uh, it had weird things inside and meat inside, but now it's more insect based, uh, and and it's a lot more nutritious and more a lot more natural. Uh, but still, there's a lot more research to be done in this area. So I have a video here that showcases enrichment. I hope y'all can see it. And yeah, no. Oh, oh wait, uh, let me share this again with sound. If I can figure out how to do that. Uh, I don't. Sorry, yeah, one minute. Yeah, share sound. Hey guys, can so we're here hear? with Nita here. Uh -huh. And you're in? As yeah? you know, okay, yeah, cool. this is a Sunda pangolin, and she's one of our females here. I'm not going to talk. Uh, what we're we'll doing here today is we're just bring bringing her out for a little enrichment, a little walk. Uh, what we do here is that we want them to stretch out their legs, uh, sniff new things, and use their tongue, dig a bit. So I have a couple of enrichments around here, and let's see what she does, okay? So one of the cool things about pangolins, if you all don't know, is their long sticky tongue, yeah? So I have this little tube, a uh, tube feeder. Normally we don't feed them this way, but this device basically allows us to, uh, allows her to use the full length of her tongue. As you can see, I hope you can see that, yeah. You can see that the tongue easily stretches, stretches out like maybe 15 cm, yeah. So I have here inside uh, weaver ants and weaver ants eggs, yeah, which is one of their favorite foods. Uh, as an enrichment, we put their food in tubes, we put the food in, in logs, in, in little hollows, and this is how they can 
uh, search for their own food in their own time here. Yeah? So I have a, a, a little rotten log here and I've hidden, well I'm hiding it now, um, I'm hiding some ants' eggs all over the crevices and we want her to use her claws. Let's see whether she uses her claws. Well, while, while she's searching there, I'm going to hide the food elsewhere, yeah? And then let her look for the food. Now, if this were a real ant's nest, she would be covered in ants, not lying down like this. She's uh, a bit pampered here in, uh, in, in Night Safari. Um, she's actually one of my most favourite pangolins ever, uh, because of her temperament. She's really nice. She's been a... Uh, she's actually a mum, by the way, if you all didn't know. So sometimes there might not even be any need to to, to claw out claw out the uh, or dig into the wood because uh, the tongue gets into all the little crevices as you saw earlier uh, the tongue can reach easily uh, 15 cm long yeah? okay yeah so sessions like these uh, basically allow us to engage them in, in ways that we can't normally in, in a typical uh, enclosure setting so we do occasionally bring them out over here uh, where they get to smell new things uh, and this is all part part of the welfare for, for the pangolins here in our care uh, in, in Mandai Wildlife Reserve. I come visit Nita and other pangolins here in Night Safari. Yeah. Hey guys. Oops. All right, so it's very weird just watching myself up there. Uh, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed that little video. So aside from enrichment and, and as you see, you, you know, it's, it's nutrition, enrichment, you know, proper housing, but what's the end goal, right? So um, what I mentioned earlier about the goals was uh, with having pangolins under human care is to develop an insurance population. But before that can be formed, uh, we must first understand the species uh, reproductive biology. So there's a lot to uncover, you know, how they meet, how they're, they're, how long they're pregnant for, what kind of uh, special care needed during this period, and among other things. And uh, as a result, you know, we've had several successful births in Mandai since 2000, what was it, 2009 or 2011? Uh, 2011, 2009, yeah, around there, well, can't remember. Uh, but, but this is just how they look when they're born, you know, they're fully scaled, uh, and their eyes are all open, quite mobile actually. Um, but this stage, you know, this, despite the armor, and the armor is just mainly for show, you know, when they're this young, um, is that it, this stage is by far the most difficult part to manage right? because babies are very vulnerable during this period. Uh, some of the challenges include, you know, abandon, abandonment by moms, uh, the lack of milk uh, from the mom, you know, transitioning from milk to solid foods. So that's also another important milestone. So these are just some challenges, but if they manage to overcome those, then they can grow up pretty fast and, and pretty independently. Um, and they grow up really strong as well. And so again, like I said, you know, insurance population is, is the third goal, but the end goal, of course, at, at some point, and if needed, is reintroduction. Uh, but fortunately, the population in Singapore doesn't seem to be in any need for any reinforcement or supplementation, but nevertheless, it's important to know what it takes to conduct such an activity. So sometime in 2018, we embarked on a joint project with NPARX to release one of our hand-reared animals. Uh, you can see uh, him walking away with using our thermal cameras here. Um, and while we've managed to track this animal for only three weeks, you know, we learned quite a lot from the project. So we you know, who knows, maybe we might do more of this in, in the future. So outside of Singapore, the efforts and the capacity to conserve these species, uh, you know, varies uh, from range state to range state. Range state meaning the countries that do have them. So they are found basically from, you know, Indonesia, Brunei, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar. So these are basically all countries in Southeast Asia with the exception of the Philippines. And I suppose we consider uh, more or less day as well. Um, so aside from Vietnam, who, who where there's quite a strong 
uh, conservation uh, program there. Many of the other rain states basically are facing a lot of challenges in uh, trying to conserve the species. And the reason for this is because of uh, lack of expertise, coordination, uh, legislation and, and enforcement in these countries is a larger, in most of these countries are actually all of them are larger than, than Singapore and it's always harder, harder in, in larger countries. Um, and then there's of course limited resources for pangolin conservation. Uh, but this pangolin conservation community in our region is actually growing and generally quite supportive of one another and uh, the partnerships and the collaborations between stakeholders is something that needs to be actively fostered, you know. Um, and again, uh, the challenges are partly due to our traditional approach to conservation. Uh, efforts to conserve species in habitat and or in situ aren't always aligned uh, with efforts to conserve species outside of habitat or ex situ. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is because there's so many stakeholders involved. It's not just zoos, you know, you've got forestry people, you've got landowners, you've got biologists, you've got uh, government folks, you've got lots of people. Uh, so trying to get everyone to agree on what's important for pangolins is really hard, right? Um, but this community, this pangolin conservation community is, is adopting the one plan approach. Basically in this approach, uh, all the stakeholders uh, come together to develop integration, integrated conservation strategies, which is basically the ultimate goal of having a viable population in the wild. So Mandai has been a part uh, and has driven many of these discussions and will continue to do so. Uh, and these are some of the uh, strategies or documents that uh, we've worked on together with our partners. Uh, so again, together with our partners, uh, we are looking to do more things. So develop an insurance population in the region, conduct uh, capacity building, supporting projects, and of course, uh, again, to continue facilitating the, these partnerships for pangolin conservation. Now, we've been involved in a number of uh, these capacity building activities over the years, and with our most recent one in Sabah, which was conducted last year. Uh, and at this workshop, and in most of these workshops, we do similar things. Uh, we share uh, our husbandry and veterinary experience with the hope that it will be useful for uh, the rehab efforts uh, in those in, um, in those countries, yeah. And then supporting our partners' projects financially is just as important. So in this instance, we support the Katala Foundation in the Philippines uh, with their in situ conservation program involving the Palawan pangolins. They're quite similar to the Sunda pangolins, but this species is uh, only endemic to one island, the Palawan island in the Philippines. So to me, I think that poses a greater risk of extinction because only found in that little island there. Yeah. Now, what can you do for pangolins? As a start, uh, you can say no to pangolin scales and other products. Uh, and then, as what Charlene said earlier, if you see any dead, injured, or at-risk pangolins, you may call either of these numbers. Uh, and if you see healthy pangolins, you can record your sighting on this website, singaporepanglinwgwordpress.com. And then for more information and tips on coexistence, check out this website there, the www.ourwildneighbors.sg. And with that, thank you for listening and uh, back to you, Vera. A lot of you have sent over, have sent over um, your questions and um, and we've just uh, we're just we're going to tackle uh, most of them first. So uh, we're going to try out this new thing where we all appear in the same camera. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, oh no. Uh, Zoom's not working very well for me. Technical difficulties, give me a second.
Hooray. Okay. We have it up and running. Um, our first question is, uh, I'm going to address it to Adi. Um, somebody's asking, can I see pangolins at the zoo in the daytime? At Singapore Zoo in the daytime? Okay. So quick, quick, quick answer is that no, you can't. Uh, they are found in Night Safari. We've housed them there and you can find them at the leopard trail. Uh, that displayed together with the civets and the leopard cats. But uh, we do have wild pangolins here in Mandai, and we have actually seen them come out even in the daytime. So I've actually got a, a couple of videos where they're walking among our guests. So as you know, Singapore Zoo is kind of smack right in the middle of Mandai. So we do have wild pangolins coming in and out, uh, going into the forest, coming in. Yeah. So, so yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um... And I guess you've answered our second question, which is, is there a, uh, oh, partially answered us the second question. Is there a healthy population of penguins in Singapore and where can I spot uh, penguins in the wild in Singapore? Maybe Dr. Charlene can help us with that one. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, well, we it does appear that we do have a reasonably healthy uh, population of pangolins in Singapore. However, they are definitely st um, still under threat from uh, urbanization and urban threats, for example, uh, road traffic accidents that we've already mentioned. Um, Unfortunately, while well, we, we can't guarantee certainly uh, wild sightings of pangolins uh, at any point or anywhere uh, in the world, um, and but they do live in our nature reserves. So if uh, if you're lucky enough, you may be able to spot a pangolin uh, in the wild in our reserves. Well, I've so far not been that lucky. I hope to be. <laughs> um, I think uh, third question is again for you, Dr. Charlene. Um, um, do pangolins face any infectious diseases? One of our listeners wants to know. Uh, this is an uh, interesting question. So um, any animal actually uh, has the potential to uh, sus be susceptible to infectious diseases, uh, including pangolins. Um, and uh, we, there's still a lot that we uh, don't know about uh, pangolin healthcare. So we are always still uh, seeking to find out more information. Um, just, just also a general note that uh, any, uh, any animal, whether it's wildlife or uh, our pet animals, uh, can potentially also be susceptible to infectious diseases, uh, which include things even uh, like parasites, you know, uh, ectoparasites, parasites you can find on the skin, um, and various other um, uh, problems like that. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I think question number four is probably directed to Adi. Um, or maybe, let's see, whether I, I thought you can chip in, I guess. Uh, how do you track the success of your rehabilitation programs for pangolins? Hmm. Um, so if we remember uh, the definition of wildlife rehabilitation, um, it's really, you know, the temporary care of, uh, uh, of wildlife that are injured, uh, sick or orphaned, uh, with the eventual aim of releasing them back into the wild. So if that's the, the overall goal, essentially we use that as the um, goal standard on how we benchmark our uh, success rates for our treatment and rehabilitation pro uh, programs. Um, and so, um, uh, if the number one, if the animal is able to be treated well, uh, well enough uh, to be considered for release, that's I guess the the first the first goal. And then the second goal is: can we rehabilitate them in such a way that they are suitable for the wild in terms of being able to recognize uh, and obtain a wild food, be able to be fit enough to climb and dig and and do everything that a normal a normal wild pangolin can do. So that's really the second sort of benchmark that, that we look at uh, for our rehabilitation uh, programs. And then number three certainly will be the actual release itself. You know, does the pangolin sort of move away from, uh, from people uh, and from the release site uh, in a suitable manner? And, um, and I guess, uh, does it then uh, remain in the wild as opposed to being uh, re-rescued again later on? So um, just curious, Dr. Charlene, and probably not one of the questions from the listeners, but what happens if you, um, you know, you're in the release process and you realize, oh, no, this pangolin's not um, going to be able to uh, cut it right now? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what's the process then? 
Hmm. That's a great question. Um, thankfully, so far, we haven't faced that yet. Uh, I think our uh, our checks and uh, rechecks are reasonably robust um, uh, in such a way that when we when the pangolins are released uh, by our partners, our uh, MPARCs, mm. um, we're usually pretty confident that those pangolins uh, will, uh, will make it at, uh, at the release process. However, at any point with any wildlife release, there's always the chance for um, uh, not 100% success rate. And so we're always ready, if we need to, to intervene immediately, mm -hmm. um, basically to, uh, to, to uh, capture them back or you know, rescue them immediately um, if necessary okay. and take them back into care again. And then that's when we sort of reassess um, and see if we need to do it, uh, how we can do things differently and mm -hmm. improve. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks yeah. for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, moving on to our fifth question. Um, what more can be done to protect pangolins around Asia? Now, I guess I'll open it up to both of you. Uh, maybe Adi can take it first. Mm, so for, at a start, I think like, like we said earlier, um, the main threat in Southeast Asia is uh, poaching, right? And the consumption of scales. So the thing we can do, of course, is not to consume uh, scales or any products, you know, meat. Um, and, and to me, I think that's the best thing you can do for pangolins in Southeast Asia or pangolins in general. Uh, but here in Singapore specifically, um, you know, like we said, roadkill is one of the main issues uh, for pangolins also with other mammals here in, in Singapore. So I think doc, uh, Dr. Shalin will also agree that, uh, you know, when you drive, especially around the uh, forested areas, you know, like Bukit Timah, you know, uh, Upper Thompson, Mandai Road, you know, you got to be careful uh of course don't drive slowly to the point that you're at risk at, of uh you know for other um drivers but be mindful when you drive especially at night because again pangolins are you know and many of the animals here are nocturnal as well yeah mm. This is a really big question, so I'm just thinking about how to how to tackle it. Um, uh, certainly, uh, habitat protection is is a very big part of uh, uh, any wildlife protection, especially pangolins. Um, so, you know, um, I guess supporting projects that look at um, protecting and enhancing. Pan uh, pangolin habitats is really important, uh, whether it's regionally or even in Singapore. Um, and here, you know, at, at Mandai, we uh, we do look very closely at our habitats uh, in and around our parks for all our wildlife, including pangolins. So the Mandai uh, Rejuvenation Project, which looks at enhancing the, the habitat that we have here, um, actually is a very uh, big part, a big important part of what we do here too. And, um, and what you can do also in, uh, in Singapore is uh, take part in things like uh, tree planting exercises as well, because... Um, uh, protecting and, and enhancing habitat will, is one way to keep pangolins in the wild. Thank you um, for answering those questions. Um, have I skipped one? Hang on. Okay. Um, somebody wanted to know, do pangolins have a set territory? Um, do they, are they territorial? Yeah. They just kind of yeah. wander anywhere. Uh, they do have a home range. They do have an area that they range uh, or roam. Uh, males generally have a larger home range than females. And these home ranges tend to overlap with uh, the home ranges of several other females. Uh, but again, it depends on the size uh, of the of the country or the, the area that they're in. So in Singapore, they would have a smaller range compared to say an animal in, I don't know, Malaysia or Borneo. Yeah. All right. And I guess this one's back to you. What kind of ants do penguins usually eat? I think you mentioned weaver ants earlier. Are there any other kinds of ants that they like? So um, I, I had to Google this, you know, uh, <laughs> because there's so many species and the names are so strange and funny. So one of the species aside from weaver ants is the yellow crazy ant. Uh, that's one species that they are known to eat. But there, in Singapore, at least, uh, there's, there's maybe another uh, 11 different types that we know of, lah. Um, and the research is out there, basically. Yeah. As for the other question, which is how do pangolins protect their tongue from being bitten by ants? Um, good question. So, so the 
the tongue is coated with with uh, basically a very sticky saliva. Um, and how does the mechanism of the pangolin retracting and you know how does it go into the tongue uh, into the stomach straight away? Um, Charlene, do you know? Would <laughs> Um, I, I can try to to yeah. help answer this. Uh, yeah, so um, the, uh, Ari is absolutely right. You know, the, the thick, sticky saliva that pangolins have does help to protect the tongue and actually also the oral mucosa uh, within the mouth. And, um, and I actually really think that, you know, because if you eat really, really fast, uh, your food doesn't have the chance to really bite you in the mouth, right? So um, I, I personally think that pangolins also eat quite quickly. And so when they swallow, you know, the ants, it goes, you know, into the stomach and then it gets digested, you know, in the, um, with the digestive juices and the acids. So I think that's uh, some of the different ways uh, that the pangolins can protect its tongue as, uh, as well as its lips and the, um, the, uh, the mucosa in the mouth uh, from being bitten. <laughs> that's a yeah, great, right. great question really though. And really question. interesting to hear the answer. So... Maybe it's a matter of eating it before it bites you um, sort of situation here. Okay. Um, I think Adiv was talking about um, tracking pangolins that were released. Um, somebody wanted to know what kind of transmitter do you use and what is the longest radio track um, you've gotten? So so the tracking work is normally not undertaken by us. Uh, usually it's done by uh, researchers. So that project was more of a, a one-time thing then. Uh, I can't quite remember. I can, I can back, get back to you on the, the, the type, but it was a radio tracker for sure. Um, the longest that we have tracked is three weeks, uh, but we know for a fact that, you know, pangolins in Vietnam, and I know the one who's asking the question, uh, have been tracked for what, months, right? A couple of months at least. But again, uh, with tracking, it's not just the the tag or or the 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 tag that it's it's uh that plays a part but also how you attach the tag to the animal uh, and that also is quite challenging mm. okay thank you so much for explaining that um and i think in the interest of time we have um i think a couple more slides which i think we can a couple more questions which i think we can probably combine um, let's see if we can combine these. So one question is, if we see penguin scales on sale in a shop, uh, is there a way that we can report it to, to the authorities? And perhaps um, uh, maybe this is part of a bigger question, how can the public help to protect pangolins in Singapore? I think Dr. Shalin earlier um, touched on collecting data or sightings. Uh, we do, um, and you can enter that information uh, on the website, which we can share later on again. Um, but maybe Dr. Shalin, you can talk about how the public can help protect pangolins. You know, if you're not an expert, you're not a zookeeper, you're not a vet, you're not a, a conservationist, what can you do? Hmm. Uh, this is a great question. So, um, you know, if you remember, the, the greatest threat to Singapore, to pangolins in Singapore really is the urban environment and road traffic accidents. So number one on my list um, that you can do to help protect pangolins really is to um, drive carefully and mindfully. Um, and essentially, you know, slow down and look out for wildlife. And this really will protect not just pangolins, but all other uh, wildlife and road users, including people as well. Um, also really important is uh, habitat uh, enhancement and, um, and, and expansion. So how do we ensure that the pangolins uh, have uh, enough of a home here in Singapore um, for the population that we have? And that really is achieved through things like uh, uh, tree planting uh, efforts that you can also be part of. Um, and certainly uh, uh, there was a question about, um, you know, uh, about pangolin products. Um, so if you do see pangolin uh, products, scales or otherwise uh, being, being sold in Singapore, that is illegal and you can contact uh, MParks immediately. Um, the, and the number for MParks is on the screen there. Um, and also, if you do see uh, a dead or injured pangolin uh, or a pangolin at risk uh, of getting injured, do call MParks or Acres immediately and they'll be able to organize a rescue. The sooner that we can um, uh, intervene and get to the pangolin, the higher the chance of survival. Um, and if you do see a healthy pangolin, as uh, Vera has mentioned, do record your sighting on the Singapore Pangolin Working Group website. Um, 
And for more information on tips on coexistence, not just about uh, driving mindfully, um, but for other uh, advice as well, do visit the Our Wild Neighbours website. So we'll just uh, stay on this slide for a while if you would like to you know, take the numbers down or take a screenshot of the numbers. Um, and you know, like, like Dr. Charlene says, um, penguin conservation is not just you know, for people who work in the zoo or for you know, conservationists who work in the field. Uh, it's everyone can play a part, right? And, um, and, and, and we hope that you know, after this webinar, you've, uh, we've hopefully inspired you to maybe take a bit more interest in um, penguins or uh, the work that we do. Um, and uh, if you find it interesting enough, hopefully you can also share some of these, the things that you've learned today with uh, friends and family as well. So um, I think with that, we have come to the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was really our pleasure to have you uh, with us this Saturday evening. Um, thank you, Dr. Shalin. Thank you, Adi, for spending your time here sharing uh, all the things uh, that you know about penguins with us and about penguin conservation. Um, those of you who uh, are at home, um, if you don't mind uh, scanning this QR code, um, Laureen, um, or rather our admin will uh, drop the link for the feedback form as well in the chat. Uh, if you could, we we'll really appreciate your feedback um, to help us make our webinars better. Um, and if thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a great evening.